Hi friends, and thanks for joining me today. Well, I wonder if you ever worry about the way that the world seems to be getting more crazy and more dangerous from year to year. With ongoing wars and the climate crisis, and now the pandemic, it seems that we're facing new and bigger crises all the time. And the world seems more dangerous, doesn't it? Particularly at Christians, who in many parts of the world can face persecutions and attacks, not only in the Middle East, but in parts of Africa and China. Even in our own country, we can seem to be pushed more and more to the fringe of society. Now, as Christians, we might ask ourselves whether God really is in control. Is God really able to work in the midst of all the turmoil? Through the rise and fall of nations, can we still say that God's in charge of it all? Well, that's not just a question for 2021. That's the question that Christians have been asking themselves for 2,000 years. And it's the question that the people of Israel and Judah would have asked in the thousand years before Christ as well, as their nation seemed to be tossed around at the whims of world events. Now, it's in the midst of one such crisis that the prophet Isaiah spoke to the nation of Judah. Judah really was a tiny nation on the world stage. But it laid claim to be the chosen people of the Lord, his chosen nation, the one through whom he was working out his great purpose for the salvation of the world. And the crisis that they were going through was the threat from the great superpower Assyria, who had already invaded once and was still threatening. Isaiah had sent, been sent to warn the people that this invasion came as a judgment on their sin, because most of the people had turned away from the Lord. And yet Isaiah also gave encouragement that there was still hope, that God had not rejected his people, but that he would bring salvation and restoration to them. Although Assyria was being used by God to bring judgment, they too would be judged by him. And then the faithful remnant would be returned to the land of Israel. And God would raise up a new king from the line of King David who would have the spirit of the Lord on him and who would be a banner and a rallying point for the people of the world to come to God. Well, in the next section of Isaiah's prophecies from chapter 13 all the way through to chapter 23, the Lord through Isaiah speaks to the nations around about Israel about the judgment that will come on them for opposing the Lord. But he's really speaking to the people of Judah. He is showing them that he is in control of history, that he is the one who rules events on the world stage, that he is the one who is guiding it according to his plans and purposes, to the end that he has determined. So in chapters 13 and 14, he speaks a prophecy against Babylon. Now, Babylon wasn't an immediate threat to Judah although it was a growing power on the other side of Assyria. For about a century after Isaiah prophesied, Babylon was still under the thumb of the Assyrians. But eventually, they rose up and overtook them to become the world superpower in about 612 BC. Yet no empire can stand forever. And around 80 years after that, in about 538 BC, having captured Jerusalem and taken their leaders into captivity, the Babylonians themselves were conquered by the Medo-Persian uh, Empire under Cyrus. Now Isaiah makes clear that he is speaking about the judgment of Babylon. Look what he says there in verse 19. He says, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord was going to summon an army against them from faraway lands, and they were... To, to lament. He says there in verse 6, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Now this is not just a prophecy about what would soon take place. As in many of his prophecies, Isaiah also has in view what will happen in the end times or on the day of the Lord. That is the final day of judgment. God's forces are gathering for judgment. But on the day of the Lord, this battle will have cosmic as well as worldwide consequences. Look at verses 9 to 11. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, 
to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heavens and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and I will humble the pride of the ruthless. Now Babylon here represents more than just the city or even the whole empire. Babylon has a history reaching right back to the early part of Genesis, to the Tower of Babel. And it's therefore a fitting symbol of the arrogance that characterized nations as a whole in their rebellion against God. Babylon already had a great period of glory and it would have another before its end came. But Isaiah was certain that its end would come. And the story of Babylon was, for him, the story of all nations that defy God. This symbolic significance of Babylon becomes more and more apparent as the oracle unfolds. The historical Babylon was not in fact overthrown by the Medes in a violent bloodbath and its site left abandoned as, as would be suggested by verses 17 to 22 if we take them literally. In fact it suffered, uh, surrendered without a fight to Cyrus the Persian who had already gained the leadership over the Medes. Now Isaiah is not so much describing the literal Babylon's eventual fall as pointing to what that represents. The fall of Babylon merges in this oracle with the final great day of the Lord, when all human arrogance will be judged and all human pomp and power will be exposed for the hollow things that they are. See, the historical event is described in cosmic and larger than life terms because of the greater reality that it anticipates and it points to, that is the eventual fall of the whole world system which stands in opposition to God. Now after the first oracle in chapter 13 comes the taunt from chapter 14 verse 2 that celebrates in this ironic fashion the downfall of arrogance and oppression represented here by the king of Babylon. Now the cosmic sweep of this poem led some early interpreters and many since then to see here a symbolic description of the fall of Satan from heaven. In the Old King James translation, it actually names Satan, or Lucifer, as the one who has fallen. But the Hebrew doesn't name Satan. It speaks of a morning star which has fallen. And in the context, it's clear that that's the king of Babylon. But the way Isaiah writes, the king of Babylon also represents the leader, or leaders of any nation or worldly power that sets itself up against the Lord. So while Satan might be the leader of the spiritual forces opposed to God, it seems to me this isn't just about Satan. The king of Babylon here, like Babylon itself in chapter 13, is a representative figure. He's the embodiment of worldly arrogance that defies God and tramples on others in their lust of power. That's why it lies at the heart of every evil for which particular nations will be condemned in the following chapters. It also lies at the heart of the horrendous acts of inhumanity that human beings and nations still commit against one another even today. That's why we shouldn't be embarrassed by the tone of this song in chapter 14. This is no cheap gloating over the downfall of an enemy, but it's a satisfaction and delight which God, God's people rightly feel at God's final victory over evil. The same note of celebration is heard at the very end of the Bible in Revelation chapters 18 and 19, where again Babylon is the name that's used for all the powers that oppose God and his purposes. So what is Babylon? Well, some people will point to various earthly regimes and try to identify them as Babylon. Those especially that persecute Christians and murder them in cold blood like Isis and its offshoots, which are actually focused not too far from the historical Babylon, they say. That's it. Or perhaps North Korea. Or communist China back in the day, when, and even today as they persecute Christians. Or the Soviet Union. Or Nazi Germany under Hitler. Some go for the Catholic Church and say that's Babylon, or it was, at certain points. If you go back to the 1st and 2nd century, you would probably point to the Roman Empire under some of the emperors and say that's Babylon. I don't think it helps us to try and identify a particular Babylon. 
because there are so many Babylons. Or rather, the spirit of Babylon is seen in so many earthly regimes and institutions. Those that attack God's people and try to thwart his purposes. But we can trust that God's plans are never thwarted. Because God truly has power over all nations. What this prophecy tells us is that ultimately, on the day of the Lord, all the Babylons of this world will face the judgment of the true ruler of the nations. Well, in the midst of these two oracles of judgment against Babylon, there's a glimpse of hope for the people of God. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 2, the prophet says, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. And foreigners will join them and unite with the descendants of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And Israel will take possession of the nations and make them male and female servants in the Lord's land. These ideas speak powerfully of their return from captivity, which they are soon to experience. And the prophet, prophecy speaks of God's compassion in bringing them back. Yet even that prophecy looks beyond the immediate fulfillment to the future. It looks at how the nations will welcome God's people in, how God's people will rule over all the nations. Like the earlier visions of Isaiah, this looks to the ultimate establishment of God's kingdom, when all other nations will submit to his kingship, will submit to his king. Now the New Testament gives us the identity of this king as Jesus, God's own son, who makes return possible by opening the way of forgiveness through his death on the cross. This is the ultimate goal towards which all history is moving. The final defeat of all God's enemies and the final victory of God's kingdom under the rule of the Son. To be clear, we're not talking about wars waged with swords or guns. As we live in these end times, we wage a spiritual battle of prayer and of obedience to God and proclamation of the good news of Jesus. As we wait for the final day of the Lord, we can know that God is indeed the one who is in charge of history. He is the one who's working out his plans and purposes. And he is the one who ultimately will judge all evil. He'll right all wrongs. Friends, no matter what the future brings, God holds it in his hand. And we can trust him no matter what happens. Will you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you that in your mercy you reveal that you are the Lord of all history. That you reveal that all the Babylons, all the powers and regimes that are opposed to you will one day face judgment. Father, we thank you for that encouragement. And especially we thank you for that encouragement when we know that there are believers around the world who are facing persecution even today. We thank you for the example of faithful believers over the centuries who have trusted you even to the point of suffering and death. But Lord, we pray that we might indeed trust that you will right all wrongs, that you will bring all people and regimes to justice, and that ultimately you will establish your kingdom of righteousness as you call people from all nations to be yours. We thank you that you do that through your son, Jesus. And we pray that we might trust in him through all things. We pray this in his name. Amen. Friends, thanks so much for being with me. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.